Um, I'm Nicole Shanahan. Um, I am a California attorney and former Codex Fellow. Um, I also run a legal tech um, company here in Palo Alto. I have the pleasure to introduce our Lex Talk speakers today. Um, and our first uh, speaker is David Engstrom, who is a professor here at Stanford. He's also associate dean and a Bernard D. Burgreen faculty scholar. Um, I like to ask questions about our speakers and get to know them a little bit before they get on stage. Oh, go on. Okay. Um, and uh, one of the questions was, I asked, what is the thing you're most proud of? And very rarely do I go, oh, oh, I love that answer. Um, you know, it, it really tugs at your heartstrings. But um, David um, is most proud of his marriage, and he met his wife a um, hundred yards from here. So um, I'd like to welcome um, David up to, to speak about administrative um, law, um, in particular the work he's doing um, with the Administrative Conference of the United States on the use of AI um, by federal agencies. Come on up, David. Okay, so it's, it's me again, but on a, on a slightly different topic, and, and I'm going to frame what I have to say today, the, the second time around, uh, around a, a pair of collisions that I've been thinking a lot about lately. Uh, the first is this. Uh, these are my students. Uh, Fifteen of them are law students, and ten are computer science PhDs. And their worlds are currently colliding in a project that I'm co-leading with my Stanford colleagues Dan Ho and Tino Cuellar, and also NYU's Kathy Sharkey in which we're advising the federal government on the use of AI by administrative agencies. So think the SEC or the EPA. Here's the second collision. On the one hand, the body of law that governs agencies, it's called administrative law, is grounded in transparency, accountability, and reason giving. When government takes action that affects our rights, it has to explain to us why. On the other hand, the AI tools that agencies are increasingly using are not yet at least fully explainable. So we have a basic collision here between, say, due process on the one hand and these tools that agencies are using. So we've been working with our team to try to understand how law and technologists can work together to make these collisions productive rather than destructive. <laughs> and our main aim in doing so is to create a blueprint for modernizing government in ways that maximize the benefits of new legal technologies while mitigating their costs. But I've also been involved in another project here in my role as an associate dean at Stanford, which is how to create more projects like ours. And here I've been thinking of the project as a proof of concept of a new kind of academic research that law schools like Stanford can and should be doing, and that I hope that some people in this room will be interested in joining. So I'm going to use my remaining time to talk about both projects, but let me start by giving you a flavor of our research on agencies and AI with two exhibits of what exactly we're up to. So exhibit A, the Social Security Administration is the largest civil adjudicative system in the country. Some 1,600 judges make 500,000 decisions in disability benefits cases annually. Yet these mass adjudications display serious problems. The first is that there's a disturbing arbitrariness in grant rates when cases are randomly assigned. So this figure depicts grant rates across judges in one region, and you can see that there are some judges, each judge is a dot, some judges grant disability benefits 8% of the time, and others grant them 98% of the time. Second, due process is resource intensive. Here's the file room from another mass adjudicatory agency for veterans' claims, where it takes an average of seven years to resolve some veterans' appeals. And so with our student team, we're studying ways to improve this state of affairs. One success story comes from the former head of SSA, uh, sorry, of the SSA's Appeals Council, Gerald Ray, who hired lawyers who could code. And they developed a machine learning algorithm that identifies cases in which benefits should clearly be granted, thus eliminating the need for a resource and time intensive hearing. Another program uses some natural language processing, MLP, to catch errors in draft decisions, as in the pop-up at the bottom right, 
which asks judges to please evaluate a part of the opinion that they've written. NLP may someday soon draft decisions more accurately than the status quo. These developments we think are interesting, not just as an application of AI, but because they press on law. For instance, we've learned through our research that the SSA tool that identifies easy grants is only available to individuals who file claims electronically, not those who file claims by hand, by pencil or pen and paper. And so the tool almost certainly has a disparate impact based on race. And yet, modern constitutional and administrative law doesn't permit legal challenges against federal agencies on a disparate impact theory, suggesting that despite growing concerns about algorithmic bias, there may be no current legal vehicle for challenging the agency's system. The question for lawyers and technologists, and, ones, and one that we've really started to think hard about, is how we could restructure administrative law to achieve an optimal level of legal and political accountability for these systems. Second, our work with the SSA shows how the emergence of legal technologies could shift our understanding of the Constitution itself. The Supreme Court once articulated two rationales for the right to a hearing under the Constitution, accuracy and dignity. But the last 50 years have seen a fixation on accuracy. AI can improve accuracy, but it can also free up resources, resources, allowing us to reclaim the lost constitutional rationale, dignity. As one judge told us, litigants regularly appear before her and say, I know that I will lose, but I just want to be heard. Here's exhibit B. Enforcement by administrative agencies is critical to government. Too little of it means costly law breaking. But going after the wrong people is also costly. And so agencies are developing and deploying algorithmic tools to help predict environmental violations, healthcare fraud, and even which of you will cheat on your taxes next month. And some of the tools are quite advanced. The SEC is using NLP to parse unstructured narrative disclosures like these to predict which brokers are violating the securities laws. But the SEC officials that we've talked to and are working with make a really interesting point, which is that the line level prosecutors who actually have to decide to bring enforcement actions, they aren't imp impressed by a model's classification of a particular broker as high risk. They wanna know which part of the disclosure triggered that classification and why. And courts want to know why as well. If a judge doesn't get a sufficiently reasoned explanation, she can void the agency's action. And so here's where we think that law presents unique opportunities for AI researchers like some of you. State-of-the-art NLP methods work quite well with short text. So think the, the canonical IMDb movie reviews within CS, but less well with complex, lengthy, and jargony legal documents. But note as well that finding the bad apples in narrative disclosures is as much a human challenge as it is a technical one. What is technically feasible, legally permissible, and bureaucratically viable will all have to be worked out in tandem. And so the idea here is that this can be done, but it's going to require lawyers and technologists to collide in the right ways. So let me close with a couple of final thoughts. Um, the first is that we think that our project shows how modernizing government is going to require both adapting AI and adapting law. And the stakes, I hope you can see or know, are high because trust in government is at an all-time low. Done poorly, we risk fueling resentment of faceless bureaucrats and therefore deepening democratic distrust. But done well, we can help rehabilitate government in the eyes of its critics and create a more efficient and humane system. Here's my second closing thought, which is that the process of adapting AI and adapting law is going to be a collaborative enterprise. And we can only do it if we can find more and better ways to bring lawyers and technologists together to create those good collisions. And so we're trying to do that at Stanford right now 
And I've spent the fa past few months trying to work up a, a new initiative focused on law and digital technology. And one of the things that I'm hoping to do is build what I'm calling legal engineering labs that will bring together law students and technologists from the engineering quad and elsewhere to build tools that can be used out in the world to solve problems rather than analyzing problems at a scholarly remove. Our project is a good example of this, but there are many other really great examples at the law school right now. So for instance, Mar Margaret Hagen, who I think is on a panel soon maybe, um, is developing a machine learning tool that analyzes text streams, so Twitter feeds or subreddits, to try to predict pro se litigant needs and direct them to the parts of a local court website that they would need to actually prosecute their family law claim or their uh, 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 landlord-tenant claim. Paul Bress, Nate Persley, and Dan Ho, three more of my colleagues at the law school are currently working with Facebook on a content review board. So it's actually colloquially referred to as the Facebook Supreme Court that uses a machine learning tool to try to manage the massive caseloads that that is going to involve. And so these are projects we're hoping to nurture and that I hope the future law community will be interested in. And I hope that at least some of you will want to become involved in them and to help build them. So thank you and uh, thanks in particular for listening to me for a second time today. Um, David White, he decided to dedicate himself to this area of, of legal tech. He said, I haven't. And, it, you know, he's dedicated himself to administrative law. Um, but it, it raised a common theme um, in my mind when he responded that way. And that is that legal tech is really, really hard. And to choose to dedicate your life to this area of practice um, is, in some ways, almost impossible to be successful. <laughs> However, that doesn't mean we shouldn't stop trying. And so thank you, David, for your efforts there. And um, I know you're rushing off to some students now, but um, thank you for spending um, your time with us today. Um, so our, our next um, two speakers they'll be co-presenting are from Singapore. Um, and it's Paul Neo, Neo and Gerald um, So. And you know the thing that they'll be discussing, I think, is a, is a very relevant one, um, also very challenging project, but they did a full survey on the evolution of law and legal tech um, in the Asia Pacific region. Um, Singapore um, is, especially in the last decade, um, has increased its focus on um, rule of law and, and the legal system. Um, and some of the stats that um, they shared with me is that uh, just in the past five years, um, the number of lawyers in Singapore has increased by 20%. Could you imagine? Um, if that happened here in the United States, we'd have a lot of lawyers uh, <laughs> in five years. Um, and, um, and so a bit about Paul um, is that um, he is very, he, he, he's very much dedicated himself fully to creating a legal tech ecosystem. And he's done it in about 18 months. And so he'll share that information with us today on how he's done that. Um, and then Gerald, who I really enjoyed your responses in particular, he has a strange talent um, that involves writing poems about legal cases. Um, so please, please um, help me by welcoming them both uh, to the stage here. Thanks, Nicole. So greetings from the little red dot that's Singapore. Uh, our presentation will be in two parts. Um, first, I'm going to tell you a, a very quick uh, story about the story of legal innovation in Singapore, which will also give you the backstory to why we did uh, this project. And then uh, Gerald here, who is the chief editor of the report, will take you through some highlights uh, as well as a quick summary of the, the countries that were covered. So um, Singapore, very small, but big ambitions. So one of the big ambitions is to become the world's smart nation, world's first smart nation by 2022, uh, and many initiatives have been launched across multiple sectors to digitize services and prepare our businesses for the future economy. But this is pretty much the situation in many of our law firms today. So this is the Singapore equivalent of David's <laughs> earlier photo. Um, to many lawyers, this could be a picture of beauty. Uh, I'm pretty sure no one in this room. Um, <laughs> but for us, it it's quite a worrying trend, uh, especially when you consider this is the demographic of the Singapore uh, legal uh, system, uh, e ecosystem, 
majority of our small law firms, a majority of our law firms are actually small, and because the small law firms are the ones that primarily serve the access to justice needs of the men on the street, um, having a, uh, a gap between the tech haves and the tech have-nots is clearly going to be a problem for us. So how do we close this gap? Um, again, Singapore being a very small place, it's um, relatively easy to marshal resources and, and get people together to do things, but we needed a framework. So the approach that we use in the Future Law Innovation Program, which is Nash, uh, the Singapore's national initiative to uh, help our legal ecosystem uh, get on the innovation journey, um, is basically a house with four pillars. Now the first pillar is business model innovation. Um, it was very, very interesting to me, um, not coming from the legal sector, that many lawyers equate innovation with technology adoption. And this can't be further from the truth, because technology, as most of us would know, uh, it's only a tool, it's an enabler, and it's got to be fit for purpose. So to help our lawyers begin to think about innovation, we wanted them to put on the mindset of a business mo owner, uh, someone who would rethink how he would deliver his business uh, 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 law firm as a service, how he would uh, look at in internal capabilities that potentially could be monetized, for example, and perhaps even reinvent the structure of his law firm. So that's basically uh, part of the, the efforts in the first pillar. In the second pillar, of course, is technology, because we know that um, technology being an enabler will actually uh, enable many of these new business models that the lawyers may come up with. Um, and we want to be able to make sure that uh, we provide the kind of a support when it comes to identifying the right kind of technology that could sensibly automate some of these new business models. So in this regard, the, the Singapore Academy of Law uh, actually launched um, a roadmap, uh, which is a very comprehensive white paper on what to do in terms of helping our legal sector adopt technology. It's called the Legal Technology Vision. It's freely available for download, and this provides um, uh, the what to do, but not the how to do. <laughs> so the third pillar, uh, which is around knowledge and education, uh, it's also very important because um, in Singapore we, ha we have no natural resources. Human beings are basically our only natural resource. And because we live in this age where there's an abundance of uh, free online legal information, we need our lawyers to begin to think about upping their game so that they can continue to value add to their clients. And to do this, uh, we also uh, uh, developed a competency roadmap uh, to support continuing legal education in Singapore. We call it the Legal Industry Framework for Education and Training, uh, or LIFTED for short. And this provides a skills upgrading pathway for our lawyers to identify the areas that they can deepen their domain special, uh, specializ uh, specializations in. And uh, to complement that, the Singapore Academy of Law also uh, rolled out a specialist accreditation scheme so for the very first time, our lawyers in Singapore will be able to take courses that can uh, lead to a certification, first in building and construction, and then in uh, shipping and marine law, and coming up will be family law. So it's only with these uh, courses and uh, the, the examination at the end that our lawyers will be able to say that they are an accredited specialist in these practice areas, and we intend to add more practice areas very soon. The last pillar is in regulations. So I'm sure all of us know that uh, many of the rules around the practice of law exist for a reason, and that is to protect uh, the consumers of the legal services. But also it's undeniable that many of these do impede innovation. And so what we've done within the Future Law Innovation Program is to put in place a regulatory drop box, not a regulatory sandbox, but at least now there is a mechanism for uh, members of the, the future law community in Singapore to raise for review and consideration to the regulators issues that they think could be uh, impeding their experimentation. Now all of this would rest on an all-important mindset change because there's still a lot of resistance uh, from our legal community, a lot of complacency. And so in a nutshell, this is where the Future Law Innovation Program comes in. Um, we uh, bring together all the different stakeholders across uh, the country, actually, um, educators, technologists, regulators, uh, entrepreneurs and investors, to help our legal community find a way forwards in the future economy. Um, the program con comprises uh, three tracks, so um, and the Lighten Up, Ideate and Accelerate, and they all map directly to the legal technology vision. So FLIP actually is the vehicle to execute uh, the roadmap uh, in the LTV, and it comprises uh, three components. We have a co-working space that functions as a legal innovation incubator, a virtual community platform, and an accelerator. 
Flip was launched in January of last year, and so far we've had close to 50 entities uh, comprising in-house legal counsel, uh, law firms, large and small, including some international ones taking part. And every week, there's basically an activity ranging from a hackathon to a tech demo, uh, fireside chat, and so on. And of course, we are also focused on helping the future of the profession. Uh, and so there's an academic partnership. Uh, the Singapore Management University Law School is our academic partner in this program. And they're using this program to inform the curriculum redesign efforts. So um, one question that we often get in the program is, where do I start? And so to help members of the legal community identify potential uh, opportunities, what we've done is to do a survey of all the top 101 pain points, uh, which we've then distilled into problem statements. And this was uh, through a survey of uh, over 100 consumers of legal services, as well as people who deliver legal services. The other industry project we did was to identify um, best practices in back-end processes of law firms, uh, working in conjunction with uh, some top management consulting firms. And this is something that we'll be rolling out uh, through a, a consulting package to our small law, law, law firms. So since Flip was launched, these are some of the emerging trends we've noticed in Singapore. Um, international law firms like Clifford Chance have come to set up incubation labs. Our large local practices have also begun to uh, spin off digital twins. Uh, Raja and Tan Technologies is, uh, is, is the latest. Uh, our in-house legal departments uh, are also beginning to launch in-house innovation programs and basically Flip helps them to, to put together that kind of a programming. We've also seen many new uh, legal tech startups being launched. Um, legal Fab is one that's looking at blockchain-based notarization, uh, and Law Beavers is one that's looking at delivering uh, law firm solutions to lawyers. We also have small and medium-sized law practices that are now experimenting with new ways to deliver their, their services to the community. So uh, a new business model that's rapidly gaining ground now is what we call the, the group law practice, and that's uh, kind of modeled after the English Barrister Chamber Sets model. Um, now, a lot of the innovation so far has been focused on business model innovation. The next phase of FLIP is going to be focused on innovation and access to justice. The state courts in Singapore um, has a new campus, state of the art, that's going to be completed towards the end of this year. And this provides us with an opportunity to basically put in place a transformative approach to access to justice by having a national test bid that will test new job roles in the, in the provision of legal services. So, as part of this program, which we call Flip at State Courts or FAST, uh, we will be identifying the major A to J pain points, scoping them into projects that can be completed within 12 months, involving the law firms, uh, the courts, as well as the, the regulators. Um, and then within each of these projects, we'll have job roles in areas like legal design, legal engineering, and legal project management, which hopefully uh, will be able to uh, involve uh, not just the lawyers, but the paraprofessional community in Singapore as well. So we want to be able to provide the paralegals in Singapore with a skills or career progression pathway so that they'll have a place in the future of law. And we also intend to put in place a legal technology garage in our courts. So this is going to, you know, one, one thing that we've heard very often from our lawyers taking part in the program is that I've got this great idea, but six months later, they're still talking about it. So to get them from idea to prototyping very quickly, we want to have an always-on type of an approach uh, for collaboration between lawyers and technologists. So putting in place a legal tech uh, garage in the state courts uh, is one of the objectives. So much of this was done in a silo um, in Singapore, being very small, like a frog in a well looking out. Um, and sometime in September last year, uh, Gerald and I began talking about what's happening across the other communities uh, in our part of the world. And then an opportunity came about in November of last year to host the inaugural Legal Hackers APEC Leadership Summit. And we took that opportunity when the delegates, the different country delegates, some of whom are actually in the audience here, uh, when they came to Singapore to also present about what was happening in their communities. And thus was born this report. So today we have nine nations represented in the Future Law Innovation Program. It's an international community and our focus is really breaking down the silos in innovation. Uh, next, I'll invite Gerald to share about the highlights of the report. Well, thank you very much, Paul, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gerald, and in the next five or so minutes, I will be talking about the research that we've been doing at the Singapore Management University on the state of legal innovation in the APEC region. So uh, well, how do you cover a study that looks at well, innovation along five axes, 
across about 10 countries in five minutes. So uh, as perhaps Kurt Vonnegut suggested, the answer is to start as close to the end as possible. So here's the end. Uh, <laughs> th these are three points that we've learned um, from our, what we've seen so far. And I think the first point is an important point, which might be obvious to some of us, but I think it's an important one to make, is that legal tech and legal innovation are really something, uh, it has really become a growing movement across all the countries we've studied, whether you're looking at Singapore, Malaysia, Russia, China, Hong Kong, Japan, Korea, India, or uh, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, wherever we look, we see, well, there's a lot of legal tech, there's a lot of interest, and insofar as um, it's not in action or in motion yet, there's at least a lot of discussion on legal tech. And uh, regulators across the board have all taken notice, they're thinking about how to update law and industry regulations for this, this new phenomenon. Uh, the second point is something that somewhat surprised me when, I, when the research came in. It is that, well, the same few use cases keep recurring across different countries. So the average startup, the mean startup in, in all of these countries, well, coalesce around the same few things. You know, marketplaces, research, document review, contract generation. And it's really quite remarkable, remarkable if you think about it because <coughs> the APEC region is really some, it's a region of very diverse legal cultures and legal traditions. Not most of them, um, there's a healthy mix of civil and common law jurisdictions. So it's actually, there seems to be some kind of uh, invisible hand that's guiding everybody to the same few use cases. So it does mean that, well, perhaps there is really an, a compelling economic justification for all of these use cases, or everybody is just copying the, brilli sorry, the brilliant pioneering work that's being done in the US, especially at the Codex Center. You know, some <laughs> other possibility here. But um, regardless of, be that as it may, the, it seems that the battlefronts of legal tech has re have really been drawn and we might be moving to an age of implementation more so than ideation. Um, and that's it, well, this brings me to my third point, which is that legal tech is not, the, I wouldn't want to overstate the point, it's not the same everywhere. Um, there are these residual variances or remnant differences um, that are broadly explained by, you know, I have to oversimplify because I have about 90 seconds left, uh, broadly, um, broadly explained by the market size and the openness of the legal industry in that respective uh, country. So um, if you plot these two axes out, and if the size of the circle is a proxy for how active the legal technology um, community in that country is, um, it looks something like this. So um, <coughs> you have on one hand, on the far right, the big economies where the legal industry is driven essentially by internal demand. Um, so, <coughs> and yeah, in, in countries like China and Australia, the promise of legal tech being able to serve such a large in internal market has given birth to a whole range of startups, government projects, and so on. And for this, China, I think, really came in as the clear leader in this field. Um, we have lots and lots of applications, so every legal tech use case you can think of, there's a Chinese mobile app for that. Um, <coughs> oh, there's, um, yes, there's countries, uh, sorry, startups like Pocket Lawyer, um, which auctions off clients' cases to lawyers. Uh, there's a startup called um, Ying Le Wang, which is, it identifies issues from the case descriptions that clients upload and then finds them the right lawyer. There's a startup called, um, what's that? Oh, Tian Ji Liu, your click law, which <coughs> is essentially giving you lawyer recommendations based on win rates. Um, and all of these other firms that I don't have time to talk about deal with blockchain, analytics, um, outcome prediction, and so on. And uh, then there's Australia, which is um, also a big internal market. <coughs> but the main difference in Australia is that they have a lot more lawyers per person than China. So it has become a situation where um, all, most of the innovation is based on lawyers fighting lawyers. <laughs> it's a battleground there. <coughs> right, um, then we have the smaller jurisdiction. Excuse me. Mm. Like Hong Kong, uh, and the Hong Kong chapter, I have to sh give a shout out here to Brian Tang from Hong Kong who wrote the chapter for this report. Um, where it's clear that uh, like countries like Singapore and Hong Kong, where it's clear that all relevance in the legal tech space will depend on remaining open to foreign labor, foreign ideas, and foreign capital. Um, as Paul earlier mentioned, this whole FLIP initiative came out about from a realization that, well, we need to bring in and create a community, not just in Singapore, but um, to be connected to the whole legal landscape. And in Hong Kong's case, um, there is this uh, clear focus on, I think, the China Belt and Road effort. So there is a big announced plan to do an online dispute resolution system for Belt and Road disputes. Uh, Legal Hackathon was using Belt and Road as its team, and then there's this uh, Hong Kong, uh, the HKU has set up a kind of a law labs, is that an accurate portrayal of it, Brian, who, and Brian who hates it, uh, is really championing Legal Tech in, in that country. So Legal Tech is really taken off in Hong Kong. Uh, and finally, we have the mid-sized countries like uh, Korea and Malaysia. Um, Korea, we have a chapter contributed by Narai, who's sitting in the audience there. Um, and for these countries, well, their size kind of points them neither to very 
neither clearly in either way, right? Um, so don't get me wrong, there's still a lot of, uh, still a growing community of uh, legal tech in these countries. Uh, but the common thing that, interestingly enough, both reported is that, well, um, one, one of the obstacles they face is the regulatory, um, the strict regulations there. But the good thing is that, well, it's something that's at least being discussed and they're exploring sandboxes. Right, and that's all I have today. Thank you. Um, yes. Oh, um, sorry, just one point. Uh, the report, sorry, the report is available for download. You just need to scan the QR code here. Uh, so perhaps if we have 10 seconds for everyone to, you know, if you're interested, so, because five minutes doesn't do it justice. And you're the first to get the report. <laughs> yes, uh, we've just uh, put it up there. Thank you, thank you. Another fun topic about Gerald I read was um, he's, he's a coder by nature. Um, he codes for fun. He's become um, a, a law lecturer, a law professor. Um, but pri a, a few years ago, um, you created a website uh, for high school notes, for students to post their high school notes. And it's still running, right, without any inf uh, influence from you, which, which is amazing. So um, you got to love democratizing high school notes. Um, okay, so the next um, speaker is Amy Shoemaker from the Stanford Computational Policy Lab. Amy, where are you? There you are. Um, so, so this one, uh, so, so this talk is, is um, very special um, personally to me because while I was a fellow here, I started um, something called the Smart Prosecution Project. Um, and at the time, the Stanford Computational Policy Lab did not exist. Um, it was Professor Sherrod Goal um, from the engineering school who was working um, on these incredible data sets involving police stops um, across the nation. And very quickly, he had gathered so many police stops in the United States that he had more data than the federal government because um, he had consolidated and cleaned it all um, and put it to good use. Um, so so hearing about his work, I was so inspired. He was way over on the other side of campus, um, and, and we were pulling you, we kept pulling you over to the law school. I, I think multiple professors and, and codexers um, have, have tried so many times to get you involved in projects over here. Um, finally, a few years ago, I, I went to per, for Professor Goal and I said, can you, can, what would you do with more funds? Like what if you had just several millions of dollars in funds? Um, could you grow this thing and, and make just incredible impact? And he, he kind of looked at me and he was like, why are you asking me this question? And I was like, well, I, wa I wanna find a way to get you these funds because I, th I, think, I think you're onto something here. And so, so we did, we, we got the funds together um, to start the Stanford Computational Policy Lab. And since then, um, the lab has grown. Um, I, I just visited a presentation by the lab and they had about a dozen of the most incredible um, social justice oriented uh, legal tech projects I've ever seen and so much data, drawing data scientists from Facebook um, and um, other groups within Silicon Valley. Um, and Amy Shoemaker um, is one of those fabulous data scientists. So come on up, Amy. Um, a fun fact about um, uh, some of Amy's research is that in Plano, Texas, there were 304 stops made at burger joints. Um, but there was a large uh, discrepancy between um, these burger joints. Burger King had five stops. What a burger, which I've never even heard of, had 64 stops. But the real kind of runaway winner was in and out with 235 stops. My goodness. <laughs> um, please help me welcome Amy to the stage. Thanks so much, Nicole. Um, as Nicole mentioned, um, the Stanford Open Policing Project, which I'm gonna be presenting about our work, um, was started by Shard Goal um, before the existence of the Computational Policy Lab where I work. He actually collaborated with uh, Cheryl Phillips from Big Local News, which is a data journalism organization on campus. Um, yeah, about a half decade ago, five years ago, we started collecting this data. And now, to date, we have almost 200 million traffic stops from across 30 states and 50 cities. And like I said, this was a colossal effort starting five years ago to collect this data. We submitted 
public records requests to all 50 states in the top 100 largest cities. And the data came in in all different forms. Um, we got a lot of CDs that we had to filter in and clean and process and then eventually released just in March um, last month to the public for people to use. Um, and a side benefit of this, in addition to releasing it to the public for journalists and lawyers to be able to start using the data, was that we were able to do our own analysis. So from the 200 million, we narrowed the range to 2011 to 2017 and took only the locations that had adequate data on race and did a large scale analysis of what <coughs> racial disparities are looking like through traffic stops throughout the US. And here are the states and cities that we focused on. So the first finding, I'm gonna to present to you guys three findings from our analysis. The first finding was that we saw evidence of bias against black drivers at the decision to stop. So when an officer is deciding who to make a traffic stop of, uh, there is bias against black drivers. So the first thing you do oftentimes when you get traffic stop data or any sort of data is you look at stop rates. Um, so here we find that black drivers are stopped more often than white drivers relative to their share of the driving age population. And while this is a red flag and does show racial disparities, it isn't yet enough to prove that finding that I just presented to you. And the reason for this is that there could be differences in the demographic populations when it comes to driving. So uh, certain race groups might take public transit more versus other race groups might be represented more highly on the roads. There also might be differences in violation rates across race groups. Um, and so because of that, we can't say that elevated stop rates of black drivers indicates racial profiling or discrimination. In order to prove that finding, we have to pivot a bit and use what's known as the veil of darkness test. And so the idea with this test is that if an officer is racially profiling, that officer is less able to see a driver's race at night, right? Night has this sort of veil of darkness. It restricts visibility. So what we look at is if black drivers comprise a smaller fraction of those stopped at night than those stopped in the day, it's suggesting that an officer might be discriminating against black drivers. Now there's a caveat here, because if I just take traffic stops at 3 p.m. and traffic stops at 10 p.m. and I look at proportions, um, it's a very different driving population happening at 3 p.m. versus at 10 p.m., different crimes happening. Um, and so we can't quite compare those. We're not comparing apples to apples there. So what we do is we take a narrow slice in time, let's consider 7 p.m. for example. 7 p.m. we're assuming has roughly the same people on the road year round, same commuting population in a given location. Uh, but in the summer, 7 p.m. is light, and in the winter, 7 p.m. is dark, right? So we have this sort of natural experiment to start looking at whether the veil of darkness is um, exposing racial profiling. So just to give an example, we're gonna look at Texas, and this is a narrow range of time, 7.15 to 7.30. And um, what you see on the x-axis is minutes since dark. So on the left side, um, those dots are all uh, times when 7.15 to 7.30 was light. It happened before dark. And the points on the right-hand side of the plot um, are minutes where 7.15 to 7.30 happened in darkness, right? So those are sort of winter times. Um, and then on the y-axis, we have what percentage of those stops were of black drivers. And you can see that on the left-hand side, the points are higher than on the right-hand side. So that means that when this narrow time range was dark, there were fewer black drivers stopped, or a smaller percentage of black drivers stopped in that time range, which is indicative of racial profiling. So when you expand that out to 7 to 745 in these small little, uh, 15 minute windows, we find that that result holds. And then we also looked at this across all states and all time ranges around sunset and found that in aggregate it does hold nationwide, um, which is now suggestive of that first finding I mentioned to you that we do see racial profiling um, against black drivers. For the second finding, I'm gonna pivot from the stop decision to the search decision. So now once drivers are stopped, we find that black and Hispanic drivers are searched on the basis of less evidence than white drivers. So we start out in a similar way, looking at rates. So for search rates, we find that black and dri Hispanic drivers are searched considerably more often than white drivers. But again, similar to the stop rates, this alone isn't indicative of discrimination. We could see differences in behavior. Certain race groups might be um, exhibiting suspicious signs of criminal behavior at different rates. We don't know from the data alone. And so we again pivot to 
instead use a statistical test that can prove discrimination. And this test, the threshold test, was actually developed in our lab a few years ago, and it lets us infer the standard of evidence that officers apply when deciding to search drivers. So I'm going to sort of use an extreme stylized example just to make sure everyone's on board with what's going on. When an officer makes a stop, let's say officer is driving, is uh, stopping white drivers and deciding whether or not to search this white driver. And let's just say in some case, the officer says, I'm not going to search any white driver until I'm 99% sure that that driver has contraband on them, right? And then let's say in the case of black drivers, the officer decides to make the search when they're 1% sure that the driver has contraband, right, on a whiff of evidence. In that case, we'd say that's evidence of discrimination. There are different thresholds being applied to different race groups, right? Now, that was extreme. It's never going to be 1% and 99%, but just to give us an idea of what's going on. Um, so that's the setup here, is we're looking, are the thresholds different for one race group relative to another? And just to give you a little background on the test, we basically use search rates in combined with hit rates, how much contraband was found from searches, and we use those to infer these thresholds that I was talking about. And here are our results for cities across the US. So each of these dots is a police district in a given city in the US. Um, the point that I've highlighted in red, let's just walk through this. If you look down at the y axis, or sorry, at the x axis, um, you look down and you see that in this police district, um, officers applied about a 28% threshold when deciding to search white drivers. So they only searched white drivers that they were about 28% sure had contraband. Versus, if you look at the y axis now, you see that in this district, officers searched black drivers when they were about 11 to 12% sure that they had contraband. So for drivers that were between, that officers determined were between 12 and 28% likely to have contraband, those drivers would be searched if they were black and not searched if they were white. So uh, this overall, you see that all of the points sort of lie in the lower quadrant beneath the reference line, and that means that all of those districts are places where the thresholds were lower for minorities than for whites. And this is evidence that this lower standard of evidence is being applied. So our third finding now looks at uh, an actual policy change that happened during the span of our data set, remember, between 2011 and 2017, and that was the legalization of marijuana. And we found that legalization led to lower search rates for drivers of all races, but that disparity is unfortunately persisted. So what we use is uh, legalization in Colorado and Washington State, which happened at the end of 2012. And we then look at search rates, post, pre and post legalization. And here you see on the x-axis is time. The vertical dashed line is the point of legalization at the end of 2012. And then the y-axis shows search rates. And you can see that there's this discontinuity. Search rates drop severely right after legalization for drivers of all races. Um, and to make sure that this wasn't just some random coincidence, we compared to 12 control states that we had relevant data for and just saw a little bit of noise, but pretty much things were normal consistent. And we definitely did not see this sort of giant discontinuity, meaning that this dip that we see is in fact due to, caused by legalization of marijuana. However, the issue is if you look at the colors here, each color is a different race group. Um, blue is white drivers, and you can see that search rates for white drivers are far below um, search rates for black and Hispanic drivers. And we also ran this threshold test again and found that these searches were on the basis of less evidence as well. So just to sum up, we find evidence of bias in stop and search decisions. And this, these data can also be used to understand the impact of policy changes that happen and what those impacts are on policing, which is an added wonderful benefit of this data that we've collected. Um, so all of the data is, as I mentioned, public online. Our website, I don't know if you can tell, it might be kind of small there. It's openpolicing.stanford.edu. And we have all of the data up there, including tutorials of how to start analyzing the data, or if you're not um, into coding as much and just want to get a personal feel for what's going on, we have maps where you can find your city, zoom in on the place where you live, see what policing looks like in that area, who's being stopped, et cetera. Um, so we're really excited to be able to release this to the public. Thank you so much. <laughs>